that we were far forward in Helmand province and uh, took care of a lot of gunshot wounds and blast injuries and uh, a lot of really, really devastating war wounds. And so a lot of these guys that we took care of, you know, we I've, you know, became really good friends with over the years. and. Uh, we had put them on opiates and benzos and antidepressants and uh, essentially turned all these guys into zombies. And so, you know, as I uh, connected with uh, a lot of these soldiers over the years after they, they came back, uh, they, they started coming back and telling me that, look, we were able to get off our opiates or we were able to stop using our benzodiazepines or our antidepressants or, you know, because we've started taking uh, CBD and or we've started using cannabinoids. You know, Israel's doing, and the IDF, you know, they actually allow their soldiers to use uh, some of these cannabinoids while they're you know, still active duty because, because this stuff works and they found that it works very, very well for PTSD, for sleep disorders, for chronic pain. Um, you know, and we, we, we really should start to uh, deschedule cannabis uh, and, and really start to allow our soldiers to take it. I find it criminal that we're keeping this, this type of medicine um, away from our veterans and, and of course the larger American public as well. But when we have potentially um, a solution that can that's not going to make them addicted, you know, and that will make them better functional human beings that will allow them to maybe connect with their families again. Uh, I, I just think it's wrong that uh, the VA and other federal agencies uh, don't allow uh, soldiers or their families to, to, to take this stuff. In mul multiple ways. We have a farm uh, in Oregon that uh, we grow uh, organic. Uh, uh, in an organic way. Hemp, we've tested the soil, we've tested the water, we've made sure everything's uh, all wonderfully clean, uh, and then we test everything again once we harvest it just to make sure um, these, you know, organic fertilizers. Uh, so we, so that's one way, you know, we, we have a large farm and we, uh, uh, you know, we want to help uh, grow the industry, literally. Um, uh, but we want to do it in a responsible way. I, I think that the most beautiful thing in the world is is the human heart, and uh, mm. uh, just just watching uh, people uh, do do wonderful, beautiful things. You know, I think all that stems from from uh, from the heart. So. Someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? What's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host Alan Sakian. We are on site at the beautiful New West Summit, the Cannabis Tech Conference. We are now going to be speaking with Dr. Kamal Kalsi. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for coming on oh, our show. Oh, it's a pleasure. Really appreciate it. I'm so pumped for this episode. Oh, thank you. You are a doctor, a soldier, a sick, a farmer, an advocate. I mean, there's, your background is very deeply nuanced, and I'm super excited to jump into this with you. Let's talk about things from a perspective of your journey who you are, where were you born, take us through things chronologically. Wow, all right, sure. Uh, you know, I'm an, I'm an immigrant. Uh, I came here when I was two years old. I was born uh, in, in Kanpur Air Force Base in India. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of folks don't know what or who Sikhs are, uh, but Sikh, uh, Sikhism is the world's fifth largest religion. Yeah. And we wear you know, very stylish turbans uh, <laughs> as a part of our identity. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, been a really interesting journey uh, here, here in, in, you know, in, in the U.S. You moved when you were two? Two, yeah. Well, my, I mean, my parents came and I, I, 
they they brought me with them. I, I really didn't have much of a choice. Were they both in the uh, armed forces at the time? Oh, or? my father served in the uh, Indian Air Force. In the Indian Air Force. Yeah, my mom was a, a teacher there in India, and then they teacher they came there. here. Um, my grandfather also was in the Indian Air Force. My great grandfather was in the Royal British Army. Whoa! Yeah, yeah. what a lineage! Yeah, so I wow. In 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 med school, they uh, when the recruiters came, they wanted to uh, know if I wanted to serve, and so I said, "Yeah, I'm happy to serve," but I serve like this with with turban and beard, and uh, this was the this was nine uh, sorry this was. Uh, uh, 2001. This is before 9/11, and I'm like, yeah, man. I, you know, I come from three generations of military. I'd be happy to serve, and so, so I did. I, I took an oath uh, as an officer in the U.S. Army to defend and protect the U.S. Constitution uh, and and everything that uh, we stand for. Uh, and uh, you know, I've, I've been on active duty. I served in Afghanistan. Uh, we treated hundreds of combat casualties uh, in a, you know, a, uh, what they called it was a uh, uh, sort of a, a tented ER. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were far forward in Helmand province and uh, uh, took care of a lot of gunshot wounds and blast injuries and uh, a lot of really, really <sighs> devastating war wounds. And so a lot of these guys that we took care of you know, we, I, you know, we became really good friends with over the years, and uh, we had put them on opiates and benzos and antidepressants, and uh, essentially turned all these guys into zombies. And so, you know, as I uh, connected with uh, a lot of these soldiers over the years after they they came back, um, they they started coming back and telling me that look, we were able to get off our opiates or we were able to stop using our benzodiazepines or our antidepressants or, you know, because we've started taking uh, CBD and or we've started using cannabinoids. So it, that was a real eye opener for me because I had never heard of this, you know, CBD before. And so I started learning about it. I started learning about cannabinoids and I became a huge advocate. And, uh, you know, I just started looking into the history of uh, this prohibition uh, of cannabis, uh, cannabinoids, and uh, you know, it just didn't make sense to me. You know, it's a, right now, cannabis is a Schedule One drug, which technically means that it has uh, no medical purpose uh, and that it has a very, very high addiction potential. And as you know, as a doctor, I know that that's just ridiculous. Um, and also, you know, I. I just want to put a quick disclaimer out there that, you know, I'm not here as a representative of DOD or the Army or the medical establishment, you know, so if I say anything silly or stupid, it's just me. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so just seeing my fellow soldiers and the veterans take it and it, it just changing their lives, I think, was, was, uh, uh, was eye-opening for me. And so as, as I started learning more and more about cannabinoids, uh, I looked at what, you know, Israel's doing and the IDF, you know, they actually allow their soldiers to use uh, some of these cannabinoids while they're you know, still active duty wow. because, because this stuff works. Yeah. And they found that it works very, very well for PTSD, for sleep disorders, for chronic pain. Um, you know, and, and we, we, we really should start to, uh, Deschedule cannabis uh, and and really start to allow our soldiers to take it. Wow, Oof. wow, what a journey! Okay, so man, so um, so Sikhism started right um, when you were a child. That was also with the family as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I we've we've uh, you know our our family is all sick. Uh, we. Uh, Sikhism is a monotheistic religion based out of uh, what is India today. You know, it's one of the world's uh, uh, youngest, uh, youngest major religions. Uh, it's only 500 years old, uh, but it comes out of what, uh, what is the Punjab region of India. 
and uh, you know the six have spread all over the world. Uh, the uh, Defense Minister of Canada is a Sikh. Uh, CEO Mastercard, Ajay Banga, he is a Sikh. You know, and so uh, a lot of times we get uh, uh, you know we get a lot of backlash for uh, from the terrorist attacks in 9/11. Uh, you know, and, and we, uh, 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 people, people call us uh, by names, you know, they'll, you know, I remember being at a movie theater uh, right after the 9-11 attacks and people would, would call me Osama bin Laden, just stupid stuff and just, uh, we, we had to deal with a lot of hate crimes and uh, hate speech after 9-11. Uh, and, and so it's been, it's been tough, you know, and we, uh, I, I've, I've got a lot of wonderful, uh, beautiful Muslim friends, uh, and so I, we we never want to throw them under the bus. So I, you know, so I resist the urge of you know, when when we have an ignorant person you know coming to me and trying to you know throw throw you know hate speech at us uh, you know because they think we're terrorists or something. You know, we we don't we don't say oh yeah, but we're not you know Muslim or oh we're not this or that because it's it's wrong to hate any community uh, so we we've resisted that urge uh, at least most of us I think have resisted that urge to throw the uh, another community under the bus um, and I think uh, it's unfortunate but uh, you know the the world we live in right now we you know the the parts of the current administration uh, would love it if we, you know, demonized immigrants, you know, or demonized uh, Latinos, uh, or demonized Mexicans, you know, saying that uh, they they send us rapists and and murderers and stuff. It's just ridiculous. If you look at uh, if you look at the true statistics, uh, um, even undocumented immigrants that come to this nation have uh, have a crime. Uh, rate less than the average U.S. population, you know, the legal U.S. population. Um, so so I, I think there's a lot of fear mongering in, in society right now. Um, uh, politics comes into play and they just, uh, uh, you know, they, 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 they paint a narrative which is not, not accurate. So. And being a Sikh has been a major aspect of you know who you've become and like kind of like what you've then been able to bring there are so many pillars of that um, school of thinking that I think have um, a major philosophical grounding in um, the importance of treating uh, uh, each other with dignity and respect treating this all like a divine um, yeah. experience that we all get to be a part of and that's I think why when you give us the story of you being in um, in in um, in uh, in armed forces, that you have a uh, an actual deep empathy for other humans that are going through um, process of getting injured and then getting addicted to to to, to solutions that are actually uh, uh, really bad band aids yeah. uh, that have much better solutions available that are currently illegal yeah and so that's that's kind of this what I'm seeing in, in who you are and where, where you're becoming I think this is like a yeah. very unique it, it's really story. it's really tough you know we uh, I think the military is one of those places where we just uh, uh, we give our soldiers all these medications but those medications aren't necessarily healing them you know it's just numbing them to the outside world. It's numbing them to their pain, but it's also just not, not making them functional human beings. And I think uh, if we can, uh, you know, there is a role for, for some opiates. I mean, like for acute pain, when somebody's got a really bad fracture, you know, you, you know they're gonna want something to take that pain away. You know, you're not, you're not gonna give them uh, some THC or CBD and say, hey, this is gonna take, take care of your pain, or you're not gonna do any sort of major surgical procedure you know, without these, these, some of these strong narcotics. It has a place, but, 
But for those people that are sort of more chronically injured, um, you know, putting them on opiates and benzos and antidepressants for long term, I think will also have some really serious side, side effects and consequences. And, uh, and it, it doesn't make them functional. But the people that I see that have been, you know, taking cannabinoids for their conditions, these are good, functional human beings. You know, they're like, uh, they're not like, uh, uh, they're not zombies. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, that, uh, at least that, that's my opinion and that's what I've seen. Uh, that these, uh, uh, these soldiers, these friends of mine over the years, they've, uh, uh, that have been able to get off their opiates and benzos, that they, uh, they, they're, they seem to be much happier and uh, uh, much more well-adjusted. It's hard, you know, after you come back from uh, uh, Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever you've served, it's, it's hard reintegrating and readjusting uh, for a lot of soldiers. And, uh, yeah. uh, but, but cannabinoids seem to really uh, help with a lot of the problems that they face. Mm -hmm. so. Take us to where um, we typically don't uh, get the opportunity to immerse ourselves into um, what goes on. Uh, we don't really get to see what is going on um, with the military on, in these places. And um, you were giving us these instances of people coming in with very, very serious injuries and very serious PTSD, just things that need serious healing. And, um, and um, in those instances, what remedies are provided are actually, you know, that's a major principle, but also the principle even prior to that is, you know, why are we there and what are we doing there? Um, and yeah. so, yeah, take us through your thoughts around that. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's frustrating because a lot of, I think a lot of soldiers go through that same line of questioning. You know, when, when we deployed, we didn't really, you know, we, we, we had a mission. Right, you know, and especially as a medical team, we knew we were there to treat soldiers. But, but why were we, why were we really there? You know, and, and I think a lot of people still have those questions. Uh, I don't think we've really answered some of those questions even now. Um, but, uh, but we were there for each other, and soldiers always have each other's backs, and uh, so we. Uh, and we carry that with us our whole lives. So I, you know, I, I want to be able to be there for our soldiers, even even now, uh, in any way possible. And and so I find it uh, I find it criminal that we're keeping this this type of medicine um, away from our veterans, and and of course the larger American public as well. But when we have potentially um, a solution that can that's not going to make them addicted. You know, that will make them better functional human beings that will allow them to maybe connect with their families again. Uh, I, I just think it's wrong that uh, the VA and other federal agencies uh, don't allow uh, soldiers or their families to, to, to take this stuff. So. so there's a couple things here. The first one is that how does one then even begin to work with a country that has the largest military industrial complex, um, that has uh, a lot of history of, uh, of going and making uh, interventions mm -hmm. um, around the world, and uh, attempting to understand and maybe uh, catalyze some sort of change towards peace and towards harmony, towards love and understanding? How does that happen? You know, I think, uh, I think all things happen for a reason. You know, and I, I firmly believe that if, uh, you know, hemp and cannabis are coming up now, you know, at a, at a period in our history which uh, seems very, very dark, you know, in, in some regards. Uh, you know, I think this, this plant has come about uh, because it's time. It's time to 
you know, for us as a civilization to start to uh, reintegrate with uh, this plant and, and all the benefits that come with it. I mean, you're talking uh, paper and fiber and uh, medicines and uh, fuel, you know, energy. Uh, there's there's so much you can do with with hemp. I mean, we can yeah. get rid of our dependence on plastics if we really wanted to. You could replace it, replace all that with hemp. And so the, I think the world needs um, needs this plant right now. And the, the United States is is poised to become the largest hemp producer. Uh, I think in the matter of the next five to ten years. Uh, Recently, we heard that China was also. Um, Ch China is gearing up, and it's going to be a race now. Uh, you know, is is, uh, uh, is is, but but U.S. grown uh, agricultural products um, are, go all over the world. I mean, nobody can compete with uh, American farmers, and uh, you know our soil is amazing. It's clean. Uh, you know. A lot of times when stuff comes out of China, you know, they, they have a lot of heavy metal contamination. Um, you know, their, their stuff is not necessarily clean. Um, and we've seen that time and time again with uh, a number of the products that we get from there. Um, so I think there will always be a, a, a good demand for, you know, American grown agricultural products. Um, I love how you said that if we really unleash this hemp and cannabis revolution and we could potentially even um, decrease our uh, interventionist military policy. Yeah, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's gonna heal the world. Uh, I, I really do think so. Uh, we, because we're, we're fighting for resources. You know, yeah. when, when it comes down to it, yeah. we're fighting, countries are fighting each other for resources. Yeah. So if, if uh, hemp can help provide some of the energy. Um, and sometimes faith. Land, yeah, money. Land, money, other things. Right? Re yeah, the resources, natural um, resources. Yeah. But it also, you know, if it's, if it's medicine and it decreases our health care costs, yeah. you know, uh, how, how much are we spending on opiates every year, right? And when we're generating more opiate addiction, how much does that cost? cost yeah. Yeah, and, and if we can reduce that by even a fraction of a bit, you know, we're, we're, we're doing so much for the world. Uh, and, and that's why I think, you know, the, the benefit to the world is going to be uh, multifactorial. And I think it's, it's going to really start to help address some of the major issues that we're facing. You know, I think hemp could be one of the techniques, uh, one, of, one of the answers. Uh, that we use to, to try to combat climate change. You know, if we're not cutting trees down for paper uh, and we're instead using hemp fiber for paper, it's a, it's a wonderful renewable resource. Uh, again, we're, we're, we're starting to slowly heal the planet again. So, yeah. That, that vision is very uh, close to the heart. It, it will enable us to um, find a greater amount of peace and harmony together. And uh, I love how it decreases the disputes over uh, religion, over land, over resources. Um, it has a, a lot of consciousness awakening uh, potential as well to help catalyze those things that we just listed. Yeah, um, yeah it's like a, it's a very um, spiritually ascending uh, technology, and it. Um, all, with the right like kind of like indigenous ethos that night needs to come with that though in order for it to be treated that way mm -hmm. there's also some cases of extreme um, uh, the dichotomy to that being like hyper um, recreational escapism or whatever else it can you and know, there, you know that's uh, I'm not judging those folks I, I you know I think that uh, uh, there is a time and place for uh, for different things, and if some people want to use it recreationally, uh, you know that's totally fine, and they they, they feel like they need to do that. Um, we can go off too yeah. far on that, right? Trail. But, it, but look, like nobody's used as a substitute for finding the meaning or finding the north star right. in life, and then that is right. yeah, yeah. I mean, but 
but nobody ever dies from like you know cannabis you know nobody's but you can get derailed from your North Star trajectory if you're not careful with yeah. the way that you use it. You know? yep, absolutely. You know, and I, and I think there's an inherent danger in uh, using mind-altering substances yeah. that, uh, uh, you know, you, you, so I, I personally, you know, I, I, I don't use uh, cannabis or weed uh, and I wouldn't want my kids to use it, you know, but if you know, if they needed to use it medically, then I think that's totally fine. You know, and I, I uh, or if you need to use, or it if medically. I need to use it medically, I would be totally fine with that. Yeah. Uh, and and so we, you know, again, and there's non psychoactive components. Non -psycho of yep. non psychoactive components. Yeah. So THC, as a lot of folks know, or is the psychoactive component to it, one of the psychoactive components to it. But but CBD alone um, does not uh, doesn't make you high. You know, and uh, uh, I, I know a lot of soldiers that have told me that it helps them fall asleep at night. You know, it, uh, they can finally sleep without, you know, having some of their nightmares. Um, helps their PTSD. It's just, uh, you know, it, it's not a panacea. So it, it's not like, you know, you can use it for everything. But, it, but it, for the things that especially soldiers face, I think it's, it's, bit, it's, it's pretty good. And let's talk about then all of that now. So, you know, as you're here now at New West Summit and you come back from, you know, being seeing firsthand what is uh, being prescribed uh, as band-aids rather than the most optimal solutions, being able to leverage um, cannabinoids, how, how are you um, w uh, doing your work in the industry for that healing and ascension? Well, uh uh, multi multiple ways. We have a farm uh, in Oregon that uh, we grow uh, organic, uh, uh, in an organic way. Hemp, we've tested the soil, we've tested the water, we've made sure everything's uh, all wonderfully clean. Uh, and then we test everything again once we harvest it just to make sure. Um, we use, you know, organic fertilizers. Uh, so we, so that's one way, you know, we we have a large farm, and we, uh, uh, you know, we want to help uh, grow the industry, literally. Um, uh, but we want to do it in a responsible way. Uh, and then I help out with a brand uh, called uh, Warfighter Hemp. Um, they, it's a CBD brand uh, by veterans, uh, not just for veterans, but for everybody. Uh, so half of the profits from Warfighter goes back to um, veterans charities yeah. and I, I love that uh, I love their mission I don't make any money from them but I I help out the, as their scientific advisor um, so they're a good brand I know that it's uh, it's clean it's potent it is what they say it is you know I, I know I read an article recently that a uh, third-party company tested a bunch of CBD and cannabis uh, cannabis products and half of them didn't even have what they said you know what the product uh, labeling said it had so you know yeah. I think the industry wow. has a bit of a problem um, and I, I, I really do hope that the industry will mature uh, you know soon because otherwise we're providing you know products and you know it may just be garbage uh, and that's going to turn consumers off and that would be a shame because this is totally. you know, it's a wonderful product um, and we just need to be uh, as an industry, a little more responsible. Yeah. And then, do you also then um, uh, have a, within within what what the focuses are right now? Um, just two hundred and twenty acres in Oregon. Mm -hmm. uh, hemp. Hemp. Industrial hemp. It was a rough year in Oregon. I mean, the. Uh, I think it just snowed in Colorado this earlier this week and it was, it's only you know it's only October uh, that's not normal so uh, Oregon's also been hit with some cold weather and precipitation which you know late in the season isn't isn't really good for hemp so I know a lot of farms I and mean, we're, we're sort of lucky uh, but a lot of farms in Oregon have just uh, been devastated uh, so we 
you know, we feel for them. It's not easy to grow this stuff. It's, it's, uh, you have to have, you have to have some experience and you have to know what you're doing. Uh, I know a lot of folks left the cannabis industry uh, to start, you know, as soon as the farm bill passed and they said, oh, we're gonna just grow hemp and make millions of dollars. Uh, but it's, it's not quite that simple. It's, it, it, it is quite difficult to grow in, uh, in some respects and you have to have some, uh, some knowledge there. And then this is all for sale yeah. as well on your, yes. Yeah, yeah, so we're definitely uh, looking for buyers for our biomass. Okay. Uh, so we'll probably have like 300,000 pounds of, of industrial hemp to sell and we'll have to likely move that in the next month or two. Wow, that's yeah. a lot, wow, wow. Uh, and then Warfighter, Warfighter. Warfighter hemp, yeah. Warfighter hemp, interesting. So that's the? That's the, uh, the brand that I help out. Yeah, uh, the, yeah. You know, good, good bunch of veterans, good guys. Just, uh, just trying to, you know, do some good in this world. And that's through education, and then through um, delivering the actual uh, product. Yeah, product, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, it's a certified organic product, and uh, very potent. I mean, they make a a six thousand milligram uh, bottle, wow. and so each of the doses there is two hundred milligrams. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, very potent, and we've had a lot of really wonderful success stories with uh, veterans and, and you know non-veterans uh, taking it for uh, a variety of conditions. Sometimes they're cancer patients, or sometimes they're folks that just have chronic pain from their injuries. Uh, and and so, if you go to the website uh, at warfighterhemp.com, you can read um, you know the you know hundreds of testimonials from you know, uh, from the folks that take uh, warfighter hemp, and uh, it's a uh, it, it's it's really nice. It's it's really nice to 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 be helping folks out like that. And it's as a substitute for opiates. Oh, yeah. yeah, as right. a straight up substitute, and also as a healing mechanism for uh, PTSD. And okay, wow. So physical injury, psychological oh, yeah. trauma. Yeah. How many um, people would you say right now are coming home um, from uh, war, the military, with um, serious physical injury or um, psychological trauma? Um, and how many are getting, um, are you guys onboarding onto Warfighter Hemp? And yeah. Well, well the, so the VA and the military system doesn't uh, quite allow or advocate for any cannabinoid right now, including CBD. Um, now, if you're taking a CBD isolate that doesn't have any THC in it, then should be okay. But, um, but you know, it's something that you probably would want to talk to your command about, or at least your your doctor, uh, and see and make sure that they're okay. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's it's you know, I think. Uh, I think every soldier that comes back from a deployment has some degree of, of injury, you know, be it either physical or psychological, and it may not be clinically significant. Um, you know, some people can deal with their, their PTSD very well because they have an excellent support system. You know, my, my family, uh, a huge family and uh, before I deployed you know they dropped everything you know my my parents my wife uh, and they just uh, they came down uh, and they spent a week with me uh, uh, at uh, Fort Polk in Louisiana it's, it's uh, not really a whole lot down there uh, but 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 they spent a week down there just before I deployed just to be there with me. And, uh, and then, you know, when I was, came back, they were all there for me. So I, I, I know that a lot of folks don't have that type of a support system. Wow. So, uh, so I, I know a lot of, a lot of soldiers uh, have a really, really hard time, you know, with that reintegration piece. 
Yeah. So we're we're hoping that we will be able to someday work closely with the VA and uh, you know the military as an institution to try to uh, get this stuff into soldiers' hands. And what is the roadmap for something like that? It's going to take time. You know, I I, I want to say something like five to ten years, maybe just for CBD alone, and then. Uh, and who needs to be talked to for this? You know, the the the, the director of the VA. Yeah. You know the, and then uh, uh, the chiefs of staff uh, of each of the um, agencies. You know. Uh, for the Army, for the Navy, for the Marines, and uh, uh, the Coast Guard, the Air Force, uh, all of them need to be on board. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, in the Pentagon, a lot of these guys uh, that are in charge of these services are, you know, they're in, they're in their 60s, uh, they're older folks, and they just think, when, when they think cannabis, they think of somebody, uh, you know, s s smoking, uh, uh, you know, a big blunt. So uh, the, most folks these days, especially in places where it's legalized, like over 80% of the public is taking it as a, uh, as a consumable. Yeah. yeah, like in a food, edible, yeah. as, a, you know, in, as an oil, they're taking, using it as a tincture. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a lot of Misconceptions. Misconceptions, so. a lot of ignorance uh, about. Also, lobbyists that have pushed for certain agendas that yeah. how do you break through. The VA is probably one of the biggest clients of the pharmaceutical industry. Oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, you, you can't imagine the amount of opiates and other narcotics that are prescribed through the, the military and the VA system. You know, that losing that would be, you know, that'd be huge. Uh, and so there, I am sure, are lobbyists that are uh, pushing, pushing on those elements to, to not allow any sort of cannabinoids. Well, this seems like an inevitable uh, emergence. And to have the old code die faster so that the new code can come in and do the healing that it needs to do mm -hmm. and save the lives it needs to save and enable more time with the families, more creative time, um, yeah, is, is very, very important. Um, what a, yeah, I won't. I was, I was just gonna say, I think, you know, we, we sometimes, uh, uh, like to beat up on the current administration, or some folks do, but uh, but the current administration did pass the current farm bill. I mean, and that did did legalize hemp. Uh, so I think we we do uh, uh, we we should. The current farm bill legalized the growth of hemp, hemp. industrial hemp. industrial hemp nationally, Nas federally, yeah. nationally, federally. Mm -hmm. The current administration did. Yeah. yeah. Well, this so. is uh, something that um, hopefully um, hardcore uh, people that are against the administration can hopefully see as something beneficial. Yeah, it's something that posi that that's positive that's come out, you yeah. know. And there's, you know, big big Republican uh, politicos that uh, that have invested in in hemp and CBD. I I know that. Uh, 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 a number of senators and co uh, Republican congressmen, as well as Democrats, uh, that have both uh, started investing in hemp. Uh, so we, we, you know, I, I think this is not really a partisan issue. It's not really a pol uh, a political issue in that regard. Um, this is really just a uh, a health issue. Yeah, you know, and it's a public health issue. We public health issue. And a spiritual also. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, 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 I love it, yeah. So we, we do really just need to open the doors here and, uh, and allow our public access to it. Wow. Yeah, yeah that's such a, such a great way to put it. And um, that same um, sort of mentality is how we've, as we've been interviewing people from MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, we've also been talking about as a public health 
issue mm -hmm. as a spiritual issue yep. that um that seeing it that way is gonna is gonna help a lot and education around that for the world's very very important to, to begin seeing it that way and hopefully we can distribute content that helps people yep. see it that way yeah. um where do you see this um emerging market of cannabis and hemp and then the way that every single emerging market prior to that has pretty much emerged where fruits are mostly allocated towards the top percentages of people that come in and invest yeah. versus how does this one have fruits that become democratized mm. and distributed? Yeah, I don't think that's gonna happen. <laughs> I just, I don't. Uh, we're, we, are, we are a capitalist nation. You know, and uh, uh, sometimes we are more capitalist than we are democratic. Uh, and I think that uh, today's day and age is a good uh, reflection of that. Um, so I think the cannabis industry uh, and the CBD industry, much like many others, will start to grow um, rapidly once large corporate players get involved. And uh, that's just sort of the reality of the situation. Now, like me, uh, I'll give you a good example. Like me as a small hemp farmer, 220 acres sounds like a lot, but it's really, it's, it's nothing. Uh, once these big corporations come in, you know, they're gonna grow like 20, 30, 50,000 acres. And they're gonna, you know, they're gonna dominate the market then, you know, Little little guys like us, we'll, what are we gonna do? We're just you know we'll so grow for ourselves. Yeah, yeah, grow for ourselves. But these corporations are gonna make a ton of money over this, and I, um, I just don't see any way around it. Um, now they're still gonna be doing good, right? Because they're still uh, they're still bringing uh, this plant uh, to market. They're you know still uh, bringing it to the masses. Uh, we'll, we'll hopefully still see a ton of uh, innovation using hemp, you know, getting rid of uh, regular plastics and using hemp, uh, you know, hemp-based plastic or bioplastic uh, as a substitute. And so all, all these industries will start to develop. So, you know, the corporate capitalist model, it isn't all evil. It is, uh, it, it, it has a place. In, in the ecosystem, but I don't, um, and I could be wrong, but I, I just don't see this uh, industry becoming sort of democratic as a, an industry where the, the little people uh, will, will get to make uh, tremendous amounts of money from it. This is one that, this one and blockchain, crypto, decentralization tech, I hope those two um, as they emerge, um, and this one with cannabis and hemp, also I, I lump in um, the psychedelic and theogenic renaissance into mm. it as well. Uh, I hope these two emerging markets uh, do what the previous emerging markets were not able to do, which is then distribute the fruits um, well. And you're right, there will be a lot of important capitalistic um, investing to move things along and innovation that happens, which is fantastic. Um, yet we are very more and more is pointing towards if people are not inclusively stakeholded into the process of the progress of society, there will be more issues that come up. So yeah. Uh, yeah. I, you make a really great point there. You know, I think if we simply concentrate wealth at the very top, you know, we're 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 going to end up destroying this experiment uh, it, it's not it's not sustainable for the long run and the only way we can sustain this is if we can sort of uh, uh, have more equality in in the way this business is done and handled and have more quality in in the offerings um, you know so so we you know, as a, as a nation, I think we need to take a hard look at our uh, capitalist tendencies and figure out how to uh, 
uh, open up those opportunities to to uh, communities and people that have uh, not traditionally been uh, able to access them. You know, and I that's it. You know, the the inner cities and uh, some of these really poor communities. I, I think there way there should be a way for the government to come in and say, hey, you. If you want to open up a business, or if you want to, um, you know, if you want to become a hemp farmer or something else, you know, uh, we can help you do that. And I, I think we, the government owes us that. You know, the, owes the people that. Uh, because the creation of opportunity potentially, if the government's already going to be growing so much industrial hemp, yeah. maybe they can give the opportunity to people that are historically unable to partake in it. Yeah. Also, there's just the microfinance revolution happening, so people can potentially put in just ten or a hundred or a thousand bucks into the um, the big pots of the mm -hmm. multi-million dollar projects. So hopefully, the regulations can yeah. those frameworks as well can evolve in. Absolutely, it, and it's going to take. It's going to take some time, uh, but I would much rather, um, I would much rather give uh, downtrodden communities an, an opportunity to, you know, uh, to to be a part of this industry and, and and make make some money, rather than just give them, you know, uh, money, you know, just, uh, uh, just you know that. I, I think government programs are great, and I think there's, you know, they, they have some utility. Uh, they have a lot of utility. Um, but meaning every day is the yeah. fire under the butt. Yeah. The, yeah, and I, I you know, I've, I've had friends and family that have, you know, had to go to the, uh, uh, they've been laid off and have had to uh, rely on, on, you know, government assistance just to make it, make it by, make it through. Uh, and it's not a good feeling, you know. Nobody wants that, you know. Nobody wants. Uh, nobody's sitting there and saying, "Oh yeah, we're we're sitting in the den of luxury with this government handout," you know, which is it's it's a measly sum. It's not uh, it's not making anybody rich. Yeah. And uh, uh, we we need to really help these communities in a in a more meaningful way um, and help uplift them through through uh, business and commerce. The two questions that we typically ask at the end of the show to our guests, one of them is, do you think we are in a simulation? <laughs> are we in a simulation? We're most definitely in a simulation. <laughs> Expand more for us. Oh, uh, I think when, when you look back on ancient philosophies, you know, you could take any tradition, you know, they tell you, and I could uh, tell you at least from from the Sikh perspective, you know, we're told that this is this is not this is not reality. That there is uh, that there is another layer to this, something else. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not necessarily heaven or hell. It's just that there is something there's something behind this. This this. There's a veil. There's a veil. And we were piercing it with our consciousness uh, awareness increasing. Yeah, some do, some, some can. Uh, but I think we as a, as a whole, as a humanity, need to definitely start to maybe uh, lift the veil a little bit. Yes. And uh, you know, I don't know if it's a computer simulation. Maybe it's some sort of a natural simulation. Or maybe there's another dimension beyond this. Uh, I think quantum physics uh, says that there are uh, potentially 11 different dimensions or 12. I, I don't know. I don't know. They keep changing the string their minds. theorists. Yeah. 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 So. Okay. I have the other, the yeah. other question. What do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? <sighs> is my wife watching? My wife. <laughs> She's not a thing, though. <laughs> but, uh, I, I think the the most beautiful thing in the world is is the human heart, and uh, mm. uh, just just watching uh, people uh, do do wonderful, beautiful things. You know, I think all that stems from from uh, from the heart. So. 
hundred thousand beats a day. This yeah, it's incredible. It is. And there's kind acts of love and yes. Yeah. Come on. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. What an incredible conversation. Thank you. Thank you for all your great work. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Check out the links in the bio below to Kamal's work. Also check out the links in the bio below to New West Summit. Check out the links in the bio below to our show as well. Help support all of us. Help us continue doing cool things like coming here for powerful interviews with leaders. Also, go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace. Awesome. Great job. Thank you. That was fun. I hope it's interesting for folks. It was really great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We, Thank did, you. we did a great job. I had a great time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I did too. Good. I'm so glad to hear that. All right, let's get you demiked.